Have you done the live stream yes. before? Yes. So you know when to start. And I already spot. started at six thirty. Okay. Yes. Okay. Let's wait two or three minutes. Okay. Should I? Should I leave it or go back? Okay. Can you stop the live stream? I already did. Okay. Good. You can leave the backdrop, I think. Okay. So welcome everybody here to the Martin Siegel Theater Center at the Guadalupe Center. King, my name is Frank Lynch, and I'm the director of the Siegel and Theater Center. This is a, a, a special evening for us tonight. Um, not only because we are reopening our set after three years almost, and we closed them, we're just trying to get back into onto the track. It's not, you know, it's always not so easy to push a wagon once it stops, you know, and, and it's slowly getting to run and we have to rebound really so many things, but this is a very important thing for us because we lost a, a friend and a colleague here at the United Center of CUNY, um, uh, Peter Cole, with whom I worked uh, closely. We published many books here, so his connection to uh, the Spanish heritage you know, of the great playwriting tradition that we inherited and we admire from that country that's over centuries has contributed. He was one of those who did go. Uh, and bridges, and it was our, I think, uh, our privilege and honor to collaborate with him. Um, the Norman Blue Institute supported many of the translations we did, and uh, got the, mm -hmm. the coverage and the insight. And everybody who ever worked on the book knows how complicated it is. Often, friendships end. Mm -hmm. we, <laughs> we continue to work with this, this has something good about it. Um, I want to welcome uh, Jim Wilson, who is here with us, the executive officer of our PhD program in theater. I think uh, Marion was also once the uh, executive officer, actually, when Jim was a student in uh, 93, which is that uh, he was there, Professor Jean Graham Jones, who uh, is also working in the tradition, in a way, the great tradition here at Cuny, the translation work, which we think not only that the field has become so more, much more important, but also she. Books we publish, but also she has been very close in that uh, field and expertise of uh, what we do have next step close to American theory and uh, other Latin American theory. He was known as Spanish theory. But uh, Marion was uh, a special person, which we will hear more tonight, and uh, an old school uh, mm -hmm. uh, professor in the way we 
They don't make them anymore like this. It's kind of the Yogi Berra's uh, of, uh, <laughs> of uh, the, the theater. It's colors like Daniel Gerald and Martin Carlson in a way. So it's a great generation that um, has done a lot for us. They're great models uh, for us. I think so many students also look up to them, learn so much. And um, so we are doing tonight a memorial. It's a year and a half late. As we all know, this uh, time of Corona and COVID uh, and made it very complicated in a way. We don't really know how to connect about He's also one of those who we lost in that time. It's a sad event, of course. And um, so this is an attempt of us to contribute to the memory uh, of him and also to highlight that field that he was so very much engaged in. And uh, we were making it tonight uh, the excerpts from the play. It was very close to him, one of his latest. Uh, very last. Uh, very last. And um, so um, we will start now. And I would like to introduce Kimberly, who uh, was a student here at the program at the Graduate Center Tune. And we actually collaborated a lot together when we were a student in Craven and so many of our programs. Now she's also a professor of theater, she's a model student. Also, she was mentored by Marion. So I'd like to thank you for um, also reminding us how important it is that event to do and without you. Maybe it wouldn't have happened. Um, it always needs a team, it always needs a group, a village to uh, create things. So thank you, Kimberly, and uh, tell us a little bit more what we are going to do tonight. And thank you for your contribution. Thank you all for coming. I know how uh, much we all have to do, how busy we are, but uh, this is really important. And we do not have to do this with you to do the rest. Thank you, Frank. We all connected late in, <laughs> in 2021. Um, after Marion passed away, and um, uh, he was 95 years old, but none of us knew that. And as many people have said, it, he seemed immortal. He seemed immortal, and he just—it was kind of a, a shocker to to me. And um, I, my friend Dr. Ken Nielsen, reached out to me uh, with the news, and I'm so glad that I heard it from Ken, who many of you know. Um, and we at once set out to do something fitting to commemorate Mary's life work, and um, we met on Zoom with David Smedley, um, Ken's husband, and Richard Medoff, Dr. Richard Medoff, who's also an alumni of this program, alumnus, and um, we had a wonderful Zoom meeting to create something, and many people in this room were also going to contribute something. Um, and what we didn't expect was uh, that the Seagull Theater was going to stay closed for so long, um, and um, and then we tragically um, we lost Ken to a, an illness, and then Ken passed away. So we have reserved for Ken tonight, next to David, a chair, and we have on stage an empty chair for Mary. We decided that all together that the Little Pony would be the feature of the memorial. This was Marion's last translation, and I think you'll understand why um, it was so important and it's so fitting for this evening as we develop the material for the memorial and everyone shares their remembrances. But I, I'd like to offer the comment that 23 years ago, 23 years ago, I stood right here in this space with Marion. We were looking around because the sound panels had not been installed yet. The acoustics were terrible. We were trying to just come downstairs from the classrooms and offices, figuring out how we were going to do the very first reading ever in this space. And I remember us thinking, oh, wait, it feels kind of corporate. It doesn't feel like a theater. And it's so lived in now, 23 years later, but all of the ghosts of all the work that Marion did from that first reading that we did, which was a public performance of Fleeting, his translation, um, and with Bene Jone Fabitu, um, came from you know, all the way from Spain, and this was part of our class. It was, we sat together around the table for our first seminar, and he was like, okay, here's what I'm working on, this translation, that translation, I have this visitor, very famous playwright coming, we're going to do a reading, you'll play this role, and you get your syllabus, and you leave the classroom, and you're like, what's happening? I see when you're doing your reading. Um, and so that it goes along with what you were saying about there's just there's this quality to marrying that's very old school. It's kind of an apprenticeship style of teaching. It's like here's what I'm working on, here's what I need from you. And boy, you get a lot back. And that is the great marriage of the Martinique Civil Theater Center and the Department of Theater. Um, just it was a great professionalization tool for me and it exemplified everything that Marion was in uh, doing the work 
doing the research and disseminating it. Dr. Marion Peter Holt was a professor emeritus of theater here at the Graduate Center. Dr. Holt, or Marion, as he insisted we call him, was elected a corresponding member of Spain's Real Academia Española in 1986. He translated into English major playwrights, including Angels Aymar, Sergei Belbel, José María de Neijoni, Paquito, Marta Buchaca, Luisa Cunille, Guillermo Crua, and José M. Rodríguez Méndez. Many of Marion's translations were published by the Martin E. Siegel Theater Publication Ring. Marion was also a visiting professor at Yale, Hunter College, Institut de Teatre uh, in Barcelona, and his PhD was from the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, and his publications include The Contemporary Spanish Theater, 1949 to 1972, Antonio Huero Vallejo, Three Plays, Drama Contemporary Spain, 1985, and Magical Places, The Story of Spartanburg's Theaters and Their Entertainments from his hometown in South Carolina, 1900 to 1950. His translations of contemporary Spanish and Catalan plays have been staged in New York, London, and Australia, and by regional and university theaters throughout the US. He has done more than anyone to introduce Spanish plays to English-speaking audiences. But tonight, this theatrical memorial will feature Professor Holt's final translation, The Little Pony, with scenes read by actors Marissa Gavani and Montgomery Sutton in partnership with our beneficiary tonight, Healing Tree, and in cooperation with Theater Authority Incorporated. Before we begin, jumping in an excerpt from scene two, I'm going to offer a brief synopsis of the play. Timmy is being bullied at school because of his favorite backpack, a bright new backpack full of little ponies from his favorite TV series. Daniel and Irene try to confront the brutal school bullying that Timmy is subjected to, a school that protects its bullies and a couple that tries to do the best for their child will witness how Timmy escapes to an imaginary universe to protect himself from the insufferable reality. And now we jump into scene two. Irene sits down beside Dan. Wrong, Irene. Why are you looking at me that way? I finally had to go to school myself and talk to the teacher. I knew you weren't going to remember. I'm sorry, I forgot to put the note on the mirror. I know. I saw that this morning, the minute when I went out the door. Oh, how could I be so absent minded? Don't worry, I'm used to it. I don't know where my head is, really. It won't happen again. They told me it was urgent to speak with one of us. The client canceled his appointment, and I was able to get away. Why so urgent? What's going on? Apparently, Timmy has problems. There are children at school. They're bullying him. Bullying Timmy? Yes. Since when? Since the beginning of the school year. What did they tell you? Did they give you a name? No. They didn't tell you who it is? Which who? The boy who's picking on it. It's not just one boy. So, there are several. A group. Not that I know. I don't get it. If it's not one boy or a group, then just who is bullying him? The whole school. What do you mean the whole school? What does that mean? That in his class, someone wants to sit near him. If someone speaks to him at recess, it's to insult him. The desk next to him has stayed empty since the school began. And they're just telling us now? So it seems. Is this something new? Is this this term? Or was it happening to him last year? No, it began this year. And, and he knows? How could he not know? I mean, that you went to talk to his teacher. No, not that. I wanted to discuss it with you first. 
And what else do they tell you? Do they give you any kind of explanation? What's happened? I mean, that all the children in a school turn against one boy. According to the principal, it's because of the backpack. The backpack. One of the little horses. I'm speaking with the teacher when the principal came to the office and asked to take eyes the mother. I told him yes, that I was. And then he told me that we probably hadn't realized that the backpack like that one wasn't the most suitable for sending a child to school. Wow. Explain it to me better, because I don't think I get it. Last summer, we went into a stationery store. It was hanging on the wall behind the counter. Then he saw it and said he wanted it. Do you remember? I thought about it. I thought it wasn't a good idea, and I told you so. But according to you, it was a normal, ordinary backpack. And if a boy liked it, you didn't understand why we weren't going to buy it for you. I mean, what are you trying to say? That we talked about it then, but you wouldn't listen to me. Hold on a moment. What is there about a backpack with some cartoon horses on it that an entire school turns against a 10-year-old boy? Thank you to Marissa and Montieri. We'll be coming back. They will be coming back to do some later scenes in the play after a little discussion. I'd like to call Dr. Richard Nuttall up here, who can, better than anyone else, contextualize what we just saw, which was the last from the last translation of Mary's very long career. <clears throat> I mean, the question is, why did he do this translation? He was already 90 years old. Uh, he was already tenured. He was emeritus. There's a thread that runs through all of his translations. Um, the things that interested him, the things that he wanted to bring forward for us to discuss, for us to learn from. Um, Marion, I mean, we question his age. Um, I thought he was 96, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> uh, because that, that was part of Marion. You never knew what year he was born. And that's where the thread starts. Because Marion's family was old Southern structure. Uh, his um, mother married his father, and he was an only child of that marriage. His father had been married before and had several um, sons and daughters that were all older than Marion's mother. Um, so to say that Marion was an only child is probably more correct than to say he had brothers and sisters because they were all out of the house. And when I say old Southern structure, the father married the mother out of a need to have the house and himself taken care of. Uh, Marion's um, mother had a sister who was a school teacher and taught Marion everything he needed to know, probably all the way through the sixth grade, but at least through kindergarten and first grade. They lied about Marion's age, and he skipped kindergarten. How many can you, people can you say that? Marion Peter Hall uh, skipped kindergarten. He was not the tallest person, this is during the Depression. He is the youngest person. And so his school life in the very beginning was very much of the same type of isolation that the character we never see, but we can project everything into, is bullied. Um, 
He never talked about being bullied, but he never talked about close friends. Um, this is a, a kind of a theme that runs through much of his translations. His PhD dissertation was on Jose Lopez Rubio, who uh, was not highly regarded, or definitely not as highly regarded as Guerrero Vallejo, who he translated later. He was someone who wrote um, comedies, and not in the Spanish term, but in the English term, who actually was in Hollywood and met Chaplin and they became friends because he would do the Spanish dialogue for silent films. Um, his genre could have been called zany comedy, but there was always an element of sadness about them. Um, and just to give you some examples, there was, um, in August we played the pyramids, in which a character needs to make money, so she rents out her house under the stipulation that uh, though all of them will be living there, they don't recognize the existence of the other people. Uh, there's, well, just, you know, to skip forward, there's also uh, one called The Last Connection, in which a woman who is totally isolated, totally alone, has one major prized um, possession. And she puts an ad in the newspaper, and she has people come to the house under the guise that she's going to sell them this, but it's really her last connection in the sense that she is doing this only to have a connection with other people. Um, the plays that Marion decided to translate are very much the way he gathered friends around him. Um, I always told Marion that it, it was the lost boys in the sense that whenever someone was, he felt they were lost or they were somehow um, not being listened to, those were the people that Marion adopted and they and took in and protected. Marion was a protector. Um, I guess, oh, well, there was one way I was going to finish this, and that was to say one of the other impetuses for Marion was to sell the fact that Spanish theater is theater. <laughs> it may be written in another language, in, uh, but that the United States tended to um, show its prejudice about um, Latino, Latinx, Tell me which film it is. <laughs> um, uh, in the sense that Spanish theater was somehow always looked down upon because of the language that it was written in. And yet, um, it is, well, this, I guess, can be um, hand stitched into a pillow. Marion's theme was. Uh, Spanish theater is more than Lorca. <laughs> um, and um, I mean, we have Gary Reyes here, who has also translated people like Connie Salone, which was one of Marion's translations. Um, uh, uh, Guerra Vallejo was very political in the sense that he was arrested during Franco. You know, that was the other thing with Walter Servio is that he managed to make it through. And I think that's a, another theme that runs through Marion's translations, is that he always looked for the people who had found some way to make it through. Uh, Pepito um, and the Catalans, they survived the Franco era where their language itself was being eliminated and erased. And I think that's what um, 
drove Marian into teaching himself Catalan in order to be able to then do those translations to make sure that that underdog survived. I definitely feel that underdog spirit in Mary. I felt like she was such a champion for me. So that's probably why. Um, and uh, I think that uh, we came together on this project with, with that in, intense spirit, and that's like such a perfect uh, marriage of the Healing Tree uh, nonprofit, uh, which you know it seeks to help people who survived trauma, and um, and this play, The Little Pony. And just the spirit that Mary carried with him wherever he went of helping um, of those who are oppressed or the fortunate or like I like this underdog kind of um, I'd like to introduce Dr. Uh, David Smedley. David Smedley. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Ken Nielsen's um, husband, uh, David Smedley, who is it was a very, very close friend of Mary's. <laughs> I guess I'm kind of adopted by proxy because I know everybody here <laughs> and have, was uh, with Ken along his uh, way through the entire, his entire presentation. But um, I just wanted to speak from a friend uh, level that I knew Marion. Um, I was friends with him for 20 years while Ken was getting his uh, degree here. Um, Uh, while I was, while Ken was in Abu Dhabi for eight years, the past, he died last year, um, <clears throat> I worked part time in my job to accommodate this uh, long distance relationship. And I had Fridays off. So I would do Museum Fridays or Marian Fridays. And I had to uh, contact Marian by text and make sure that I could come. <laughs> it wasn't an easy process. It was a very long drawn out process to make sure that it was okay to uh, join him for lunch on our Fridays. Uh, as you can imagine, it was uh, quite something. Him being a true Southern gentleman of a very different time, uh, our texts were kind of what I call monogram gilded stationary text. <laughs> <laughs> but I loved it. <laughs> um, so whether permitting or depending how he felt, or if he could walk, or, or if he just was under the weather, depend, we would go to our usual place for lunch. We would have the same thing for lunch on the same walk, and we would talk about the same thing every time. Uh, he would first ask about our cat, Toby. Uh, he never met Toby, but he loved him as if it was his own. Then we would talk about Trixie, his cat, who died uh, pre before, a couple years before. Uh, we would catch up on the week, my week, uh, all the horrible things that were happening in the world. But honestly, I, I couldn't wait until we got to the good stuff, which is he loved to tell the stories of traveling, uh, Spain, uh, him being a writer for Gorbidal, uh, sorry, Gorbidal's typist. Uh, and I love Gore Vidal, so I couldn't get enough of these stories. Uh, being gay in the New York 70s, which I was fascinated by, uh, I have to just draw those out of him. And of course, uh, his love of opera. He repeated these stories all the time, and I didn't care. He could weave a story with eloquence, and I was his captive audience. Uh, Marion was Ken's shadow advisor while he was writing his dissertation. I don't know if I'm allowed to say that, but... <laughs> uh, <laughs> but um, Marion was a protector of the underdog. I, I wrote that down too, so it's interesting. Um, and of those he saw potential in, Ken fit that profile, and the two forged uh, a friendship outside of uh, his mentorship. Uh, I can say Ken definitely carried this on in his career, Ken was definitely a protector of the underdog um, and of his students. Um, as a result of Marion's friendship, his kindness, and his guidance, 
So that was Marion's gift to uh, his friends and his colleagues. And that's, that's all I wanted to say, that we lost someone very rare. Thank you. I'd like to bring up Dr. Jean Brampton. Oh, Dean was, Dean was my dissertation advisor, by the way. Oh, look how she turned it out. Yes. <laughs> okay, and I brought a prop because I'm a performer. So I first met Marion in 2004 when I joined the faculty at the Graduate Center. Even though by then he had retired, um, Marion gave me his sprightly, warm welcome at the theater program semester opening party that fall. And until his health precluded it, he was an enthusiastic attender at all such gatherings. He always showed up. It was wonderful. Always curious to hear about my translation and research projects and travels while chatting passionately about his own. When we met, I already knew of Marion's important contributions to Spanish and Catalan theater, particularly through his translations. But I first come across Marion's name when I was a graduate student and purchased a used copy, this used copy, of this book, which is part of the PAJ publication series, Drama Contemporary. I'm sorry, Bonnie Maracas not here because she's the one who published it. It's George Woodyard, who was the founder of the Latin American Theater Review, um, the largest U.S. Latin American theater journal, and one of my own professional mentors, Marion had edited this collection of four plays by Latin American novelist playwrights. Cleverly connecting with an eye on the market, which Marion always had, and I commend him for, cleverly connecting Latin America's well-known literary boom with its less well-known but equally accomplished theater, novelist Ronicus. Marion's own translation contribution here was Chilean author Antonio Scarmica's Burning Patience, a play about Pablo Neruda through friendship with a young postman that Scarmica had adapted from his own screenplay, which in turn was transformed into the 1994 Italian hit in Portino. Marion's translation practice stands out to me for its linguistic precision and care, but even more so for his commitment to staging. Marion would complain about English language translations that were too literary and not envisioned for the stage, which he adamantly, and I think correctly, considered the goal of any translated play. He worked closely with playwrights and producers to see his translation staged. He published multiple affordable translation collections, many of them with the Siegel Center, as is noted, and his translations were very successful, especially in U.S. regional and university theaters. And I want to underscore that because these are arenas that are not known for their international play programming, but with far more audience reach than New York, though his translations were performed here as well. In fact, Marion had two agents one handling his Spanish and Catalan playwrights, and the other representing Scarmita, and who, according to fellow translator Phyllis Vatlin, secured Marion more than 20 different professional productions of Burning Patients. I know only a couple of US-based theater translators who have a single language, <coughs> and their name has two. I'll close by saying that the last time I saw Marion was at his apartment. I've gone there with our mutual friend and London-based colleague, Maria Vangelo. In fact, Maria was in one of the pictures we can hear. Maria and Marion shared an expertise in and passion for Barcelona's theater. And even though by then Marion's health was not good, his spirits were in great form, and he was piercingly, I've chosen these adverbs very carefully, <laughs> he was piercingly interested in learning what shows we were seeing, where we were traveling next, what we were writing, we get the picture. That was me. Mm. Yeah, so much of that resonates with me too. I mean, I remember him at the theater 
like every time he was doing a show, we would come and he would find that in the seat stick with this intensity of let's talk about what you just saw and think. Um, and he would he would come to your shows as well and do the same thing. I had so many conversations with Mary in the seat. Like there wasn't even enough time to chat in the lobby. We had to do it right there in the middle of the of a row, leaning up against the seat. Sometimes for a long time, a while if you don't go. Um, I it was like, quite a surprise to hear uh, Jean talk about uh, Mary from the perspective of a student, actually, and finding that uh, scarment of translation in that book. Um, I was his last class, I was his, in the last class that Mary taught already at uh, Professor Emeritus here. Um, and uh, Dr. Jim Wilson, who is now our executive officer, uh, head of the Peter program right now, um, was also a student of Marion's, and I feel like will elaborate. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you for organizing this. This is terrific. Uh, as Kim and Frank said, I am currently the EO of the Theater Performance Program. I'm also an alum, and now I think I can also say that I'm also a lost boy. I think that I could be considered uh, one as well. Uh, and I'll begin by saying it's no exaggeration to state that Marion Holt uh, really is the basis of my career. When I applied as a non-matriculant student in spring of 1993, exactly 30 years ago, Marion was the acting EO. He allowed me to register for classes for the following fall, and the rest is, as they say, history. Um, Actually, I did not meet Marion at the old 42nd Street Graduate Center. We met accidentally at Splash Bar. <laughs> <laughs> I hear some people know Splash. Uh, it, Splash was a notorious gay hotspot in Chelsea. Uh, and it was also famous for its musical Mondays, which every Monday night they would show on uh, fabulous clips for the stage and screen. <laughs> he was there with an old friend. I was there always. <laughs> uh, frankly, uh, Musical Mondays was my nirvana, and I loved being among the screaming musical theater queens. And they would throw stacks of cocktail napkins in the air to watch them fall like feathers whenever there was a particularly thrilling video. Remember, Marion was bemused by all of this, but he was a good sport. For years, though, we laughed that Splash, with its go-go boys dancing on the bar, was the site of my first office hour with the EO of the <laughs> In all serious, Mary and I hit it off immediately, and throughout my, gra my graduate career, we frequently got together socially to catch up on shows we had seen in New York, uh, discuss his translated plays that were performed in Spain, and talk through my own research pursuits. He was extremely generous, and I recall him allowing me to attend his meta theater class when my idol, Charles Bush, uh, had joined as a guest speaker. Marion also uh, gave me feedback, encouragement, and advice as I prepared for the Spanish language exam. And frankly, I couldn't have gone through it without him. Today, I can't look back at my years in graduate school without seeing him there. Marion was never actually my teacher, but he taught me so much about world theaters, academia, and the art of translation. He was never my formal advisor, but he offered invaluable guidance as I moved from non-matric to matriculated student to uh, candidate to eventually PhD. And Marion was never my departmental colleague, but he showed me by example what it means to be a deeply engaged, empathetic, and magnanimous faculty member. I want to thank Marion, and in tribute to the memory of this kind and gentle man, I proverbially throw a stack of cocktails. <laughs> Dr. Gary Ron, would you like to come up? I also have portable mics for anyone who prefers. 
Can I, can I, can I put this hand up? Yeah, I, I, can, right? can you hear me? Hi, all. I'm Gary Race. I'm a sometime theater translator. <laughs> and I hear everyone saying uh, when they first met Marion, and I, I'm not quite sure when I first met him. I think it was at the, re the revival of Jaime Salome's Bitter Lemon at Puerto Rican Traveling Theater. And Jaime was there. And so was my, I, I, you've heard of me mention Lorraine, my former professor, my mentor, Phil Zavin, another uh, extremely accomplished uh, theater translator. And I was going on and on. He just written a play, and he, Phil is where they were going back and forth. He said, Oh, it's an El Senor de la Patraña. Phil said, It's untranslatable. The little bell went off. I said, Oh, you know what? I'm, I'm going to find that play. It was so long ago when I went to buy it, I actually called my university bookstore to order it. And of course, uh, that this an hour after I was uh, thinking about it, the book arrived from Heine uh, to my Brooklyn apartment. So here it is. See what you can do with it. And so I, I translated. I, I told Charles I translated. She said, oh, "You know, I think I have a a salon comedy in the drawer. You know, I think Marion does too." She said, "Oh, you're never going to get them published three different translators in in, in one volume." Mm -hmm. uh, but in fact, uh, here it is. Uh, three comedies. Uh, I'm jumping to the end. Uh, Marion said, first time I was ever at his famous uh, West 71st Street apartment, he said, come on over, can I come get the manuscript? And when I got it, my heart said, it was mimeographed. But that, that, that's how long ago it had been. And, you know, there were some problems with it. I, I thought, I mean, problems in quotes, taboo, have a U in it. And I said, okay, he's not making do with you. If you retype it, I'll take you to lunch. That was the first of our, <laughs> first of our many lunches. So I brought it back to him. I don't like to change anything. It would be a period missing. And, and that's when I got my tutorial, my informal tutorial for my the one hour with him going through manuscript. Uh, up to that point was the most I had ever learned about uh, theater translation. Um, I'm hoping these stories amuse you. <laughs> Nothing else. Uh, at uh, Marion's passing, I, I was asked to uh, write a short remembrance uh, about him for the for a, a special uh, issue of his strain of <laughs> as I was gathering my thoughts, Phyllis, who as I call her, uh, teacher, mentor, colleague, friend, uh, wrote me fifty times, uh, you know, with, with another picture. Where's this picture from? What, what, what theater is this? Who is that standing there? And, and you know, as we were going over, I realized. Very quietly, the kind of guy was that, that Marion had been in my life for 30 years. I mean, we, we were in, I don't know how many pictures. Did you saw one of them flashing up before from uh, the Thalia Theater with uh, Jaime, in fact, and uh, the editors of the Estrano series now, Edie Day and Susan Baron Barry, Yumi, and others, and Odd Hell, Hugh Oreos, and the famous director. But you know, we had been on panels together, uh, we were on an Estrano panel together. In Delaware, Ohio, and at an Alta conference panel, and, and even one at the Institute of Cervantes. And I got to see his translation of, of Where was La, La Fundacion here in New York, uh, also Las Meninas before that. Uh, it's also, I think, Puerto, right? And then I think in your pony, I was a stage reading, and so on. He came to the, the uh, English language debut of Premier, if it was what I was correct, it's Premier uh, of uh, uh, Life is a Dream. My translation, uh, and also uh, a staged reading of the uh, El Señor de las Macarenas, which I call the uh, Rigmaroles. <laughs> but you know, that was 30 quiet years, and then many pictures, and it, it sort of shocked me in some way that, that our, our lives had been so, uh, our professional lives, so intertwined. Um, I, I hear your reminiscences about it, you know, what he was like, what can you say about him, fantastic guy, right? He wore his learning lightly, uh, talented, accomplished, kind, generous. I like the underdog thing. Uh, I'm one trying to figure out now if I'm a lost boy. <laughs> anyway, quick with a smile, uh, glad to hear a joke, including if I remember correctly, an off color one. Um, witty, always delightful company, and I called him in that my little reminiscences are puckish and they don't screech. I wonder if anyone knows this, I'm sure. I, I, I was a little bit surprised. During one of my last visits with him, 
Uh, first of all, he, he gifted me his Catalan dictionary. Right now, I'm, I'm, I'm particularly moved by it. Um, a little bit flipping through a scrapbook. It may have been his his uh, book on the South Carolina theaters, or it may have also been a face like There were a lot of pictures of him. There he was, I think one of them's up there, him acting in a role as a waiter, I think, right? And I remember that I was so surprised to see him. I didn't know he had had an acting career. And as we got to the 1940s, there he was in uniform. And I, it, it took me aback. And I don't know why I should be surprised. Uh, there was a draft and there was a world war raging, but there he was. And he, he told me how lucky he was in the war uh, for two reasons. Uh, he was shipped out to uh, the Asian Pacific, to Saipan. I went, did you, did you know this? And, you know, this. I was so surprised to hear it, to see him there. Uh, by the time he got there, there was a buzz that something big was going to go on. You know, everything's kept secret and uh, no internet. And, and in fact, uh, he, he felt the tremor of the atom bomb go off in uh, Hiroshima. He was, this is where the luck comes in, close enough to sense it, far enough not to be affected by it. And he also told me, again, in his very low-key way of, you know, about his luck, Saipan was one of the bloodiest battles of World War II. Uh, so much so, it was the only one in which both commanding officers were killed. Now, if you know generals or whatever they were, they, these are the guys who are, I remember from my naval academy days, in the rear with the gear. You know, uh, so it must have been a fierce firefighter. He, he actually um, missed that too. So, Marion, we all we all miss you, and we won't be easily forgotten. Thank you. Can I just add one thing about his service? Please, can, do you want? Do you need a mic? I don't know. Do I know something? <laughs> are we recording this? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, of course, Marion being Marion, people that he was closest with um, during World War II was the women who were the prisoners of war in that camp. That's who he would reminisce about. It wasn't about the service, it was about these poor women that he would, needed to look after. Because that's who Marion was. Yep. And also uh, his service in, in World War II after he went to college, um, the GI Bill. And that is how his formal education began that, that brought him to us. A very interesting connection there. I'd like to invite anyone else who would like to say something right now about Dr. Mary and Peter Holt. I know I've been in correspondence with people I never met in person about the memorial and you may be lurking and have something to say. Other students. Hi, uh, my name is Jason Ramirez. I'm a graduate of the program. Uh, I came in, I think, just before Jim the first time, because I'm one of those failing students. Um, I came and then I left, and then I came back, and I'm lucky to have wonderful people um, help me through at the end. Um, but I'll tell you something about Mary. I was the first Latino student um, at, during my time at the Graduate Center. Um, and I was, a, I was a CUNY student. I went to Lehman, I went to Hunter, and I came to the Graduate Center. And uh, around three people around the hall, uh, I, was, I was just looking for things. It was at the old Grace Building. And Marion kind of grabbed me, pulled me into his office, kind of office. And he said, Oh, I hear you're, you know, Jason. And I was like, Okay, yeah, yeah, sure. I, I didn't know who he was. And he said, I have three things for you. And I went, okay. And he handed me a book and he said, this is Antonio Scarabas, uh, Death in the Maiden. He goes, here is a, um, a video cassette of Intar's production of Death in the Maiden. Um, don't tell anybody you have this, because it's a Billy Rose uh, theater collection. And he said, and here is actually my copy of a DVD given to me by Antonio Scarabas of his film version from Germany. And he said, so I'd like you to study all this and write, write papers on this. And that was my start. So I definitely feel like I was a lost boy because I didn't know my way around at all. Um, and Marion made it his point to come find me. And I'm forever grateful and forever miss him. Yeah.
Reed Dorfman. Did you mean Dorfman? I'm Dorfman, right? Yeah. No, I mean, I think we all have Scarman in our head from the one. Oh, no, I'm speech. I'm Scarman. 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 Hi, my name is Stephen Capsudo. I met Marion when I was about 24 years old. Uh, Phyllis Zatlin, whose name comes up a lot. Uh, I was one of her students. I never went to CUNY or any place that Marion taught, uh, but I was sitting across from him at dinner after a production of one of his translations in Philly. And uh, he said, oh, what's your name? I said, Stephen Capsudo. And this is how his mind works, right? He had read a translation I had done when I was 22, a theater translation, and he remembered it. And he started analyzing it. He's like, you're the guy who translated this. I love that page where, and he starts analyzing this whole like string of dialogue that's one series of puns after another. And I'm like, you know, I know he probably can do this with like 50 different people who he's read over the last year. So we, we just sort of kept in touch and we would get together for lunch, the famous you know, lunches in Marion's apartment, or the two restaurants that we would walk to and have, as you said, the same meals over and over. Um, and he's who I learned uh, about all of the Catalan playwrights who I wasn't translating, who he felt I needed to know about in order to understand the ones who I was translating. Uh, so he's just a very special person and I wound up knowing him. I'm almost 60 and I know I was 24 and a very long and productive friendship. Hi, I'm uh, Phil Alexander, uh, graduate 1999 from the program, and um, a student of Maryland's, uh, his meta theater class, um, and also worked with him as a, a graduate assistant. Uh, and. Uh, Back in the days when they had the, the green, the black and green monitors, um, you know, and um, yeah, I think I was, I think I was, um, was I, I can't remember what my job was, but I think I may have been like, trying, you know, maybe taking his manuscripts and then typing them into, you know, a computer format or something, um, and. Uh, um, just, I'm, really, I'm glad to hear um, more about uh, Marin's life and scholarship. And, uh, uh, you know, I was uh, thought of him as this uh, just wonderful, kind uh, person and, and teacher. And, uh, yeah, that uh, this, um, I, I saw him, um, I didn't so much get this sense of the of the champion of the underdog from my personal experience, but just that he was just this undying interest to 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 get the to get the message out, to get the learning out, to make sure that that other people knew what he appreciated and knew what he saw. Not because not because it was at any point of arrogance or anything, just because he was just so enthusiastic about the art. He didn't want people to not uh, appreciate that and not to not to see the connections that he made either. So, so in that respect, I felt like he was, uh, uh, you know, just this an arts advocate, if you will, a theater advocate, and um, and yeah, a, a, a teacher uh, in his in his bones and in, in, in his actions. Thank you. I'm just making sure that's everyone who wanted to say something right now. Um, I, I kind of like that some of us are taking away this um, underdog undercurrent that's coming through. I think you really appreciate being characterized that way. Um, and I, I also want to unofficially acknowledge the fact that the actors and I came together through the Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion uh, membership team uh, at the uh, Players uh, uh, in Gravity Park, founded by Evan Blue. And so we all carry very much that spirit along with our um, beneficiary healing tree, and all the links are in you know, their digital program with those things. I want to jump back into the Little Pony and then maybe we have a little bit less of a formal uh, discussion based on the couple of other scenes we have for you. Uh, before we do, I just want to read something that 
you find a lot of this in Marion's preface to his translation, but I just want to give offer you Marion's own words about translating. The primary aims of the translator have been, have been at all times playability and recreation in English, insofar as possible, of the quite distinct verbal tones of each play. This particular uh, preface I'm reading from is from the three plays by Widow Ayo, um, but he says similar things in all of his prefaces and to um, the little pony of it as well. Um, if you experience the translation, that you, you would never, it never occurred to you that the play was ever in any other language. Um, and I, I definitely feel that characterizes uh, Baco de Serra's uh, play here as translated by Marion Peter Paul. So we're going to jump into scene six from The Little Pony, where the framed picture of Timmy has remained on the wall. Irene is standing in the middle of the room. Suddenly, we hear the sound of a key in a lock and then a door closing. It's Daniel who enters, upset, unkempt, and with his shirt outside his head. Where is he? Are you an idiot or out of your calm mind? Calm down. You want me to calm down? You've gone to the school like a lunatic, threatening the children on a playground, and they have to call the police. You don't know how those people received me, the way they treated me, and the things that they said to me. Then <laughs> what did you expect? You turn up in the classroom without warning, you see Timmy at his desk by force, and you leave slamming the door? Did you think that that was proper behavior? What I should have done was take a can of gasoline and set the whole school on fire. Then the boy was ashamed to hear his father shouting in the hallway. He didn't know where to turn and he ran up onto the street. I just asked him, where is he now? In the bathroom. The police brought him home. They found him alone and crying, walking down a highway. So you fix everything by getting a new backpack and going to the school. I'm sorry. I got upset. I, I didn't know. You gave him a glass of milk and ran a warm bath for him. He's in the house, in the bath, white as a sheet, and stared out of his boots. Do you have any idea what you've caused? I've already told you I'm sorry, haven't I? And what's that mean? What do you mean? Come on, explain yourself. It doesn't seem to me fair that they believe the other children without even asking Timmy his version. It amazes me that you don't take some of the blame. It ought to make you feel ashamed. Ashamed? Because I say what I think and I'm not a sheep following the flock? I don't know if you realize it, but you've said all the parents against That man, Irene! The principal, what he wanted from the start was to get rid of the boy. And he succeeded. They haven't given Timmy the right to defend himself because the principal has done just what suited him. Stop trying to understand what I'm trying to tell you. The school is delighted that they pick on Timmy. And they point him out. And, and they, they even permit it, or don't you realize that? You shouldn't put it out. That man hates Timmy with all of his soul, I think. When he looked at the boy and spoke to him, there was anger in his voice. If you had seen how he clenched his fists and the look in his eyes, I am telling you now and truthfully, I don't know how I kept from taking him by the neck and slamming him against the wall. They're going to take action in the matter and file charges. We called a moment ago and I tried to get him not to. It's impossible. They're very upset. And there's no way. I only behaved like any father would have done in my place. Things aren't done that way. Things are done calmly and politely. Calmly and politely will get you nowhere. But if they didn't say that, the other day you said just the opposite. For you to agree with me just once about something. 
Because it seems like someone's paying you a salary to turn against me day and night. Do not as easy to deal with as you think. Not by a long shot. Not to understand me. I try to do my best. That's not always true. You defend Timmy because he's your only son, but you are just as quick to refuse to pick up certain people in your path. Don't give me that one. You've said it yourself. There are people you'll never let into your path, according to you. Irene, mean, don't keep this up or you're really going to get me angry. Get as angry as you want because no one is perfect. And we all do things that aren't right. Everyone. Or didn't you and your brother, when you were children, laugh at a girl who had a deformed back mean, and, and wore a bracelet? I said, don't keep this up. What did you call her? Damn it, enough! Okay. I, I have to remind you of things because you believe you're one way when actually you're very different. You think you're better than anyone else, when in reality, you behave just like those kids you've just threatened in school. It's one thing to laugh at somebody, and another very different thing to insult and attack a person. Don't confuse it, don't compare me with them. I'm comparing you because he is exactly the same. I can't believe You're justifying that your son- I'm not has... justifying anything. I'm only saying. Yes, you are. You're justifying it, and it's plain to see. You only have to listen to what's coming out of your mouth, or, or don't you listen to yourself when you talk. <laughs> what if I get through to you? I don't know if you understand that. No. It's not so difficult. But you always want everyone to see things your way. Well, I can't be. I can reason with the doorknob easier than with you. Then I don't know what we're doing here. Or why we keep on arguing. You've just gotten more family into a real mess. Let them report me to the police. Let them arrest me. Let them do what they like, but I swear to you, before that man gets his way and expels Timmy from school, before that I will see that he's out of a job. Not all I could for a long time. You don't know how much. But there are things that are impossible to change. And your head is one of them. Are you telling me that you aren't even capable of understanding why I did what I did? I'm sorry, but what you want is for me to approve, and I'm not going to do I that. I can't believe this. Instead of making an effort to understand me, and I, I happen to be your husband, you're taking the side of those thugs. They have had to call the police because you entered a school full of children and began to threaten them. What you ought to do is stop deceiving yourself and start to see things as they really are. Timmy ran away from school and was lost for more than two hours. How do you expect me to talk to you? A father you think wouldn't put his family in danger and you can't stop doing I, it. I have not put anyone in danger. I went to defend my son, which is different. Sure. And, and that's why they're going to bring charges against him. Let them, let them bring in charges and put me in jail. But you'll see how from now on they will damn well leave the boy in peace. I get it. You're not putting your son in danger. You just go out to defend him. And I, on the other hand, instead of protecting him and worrying about his safety, what I do is not let him have his way, try to uh, camouflage him and make him scared to death. The other day, when he was playing with his cousin. <laughs> <laughs> they exchanged clothes. She put on his shirt and he put on her blouse. As soon as you realized it, you made him take it off and put his shirt back on. I did it because her parents would be coming to you. You did it because you didn't want your brother to see him dressed like that. 
I didn't want the boy to go outside into the street that way and have someone do something to him. How many times do I have to tell you that? Is that so difficult to understand? He wasn't outside in the street. He was right in here at home. Yes. But I let him at home and he didn't want to do it outside. He's growing up by reading and the problem all and you don't want to recognize it has only begun. Because the boy is starting to make his own choices. The boy is growing up. Doesn't mean that he can make the right choices. It's gone. We aren't going to get anywhere with this. And besides, we're talking about different things. Well, I don't think so. I think basically we're talking about the same thing. It's just that what you say sounds nicer than the way that I put it. Boy in the class with the pony backpack. Even though we don't want to see it. It was a hell of a big decision. A hell of a mistake. I mean, in my no matter how much you prune and prune, a, a rose bush won't grow jasmines. Jasmines? Or carnations? How else can I explain it to you? The rose bush is going to keep on producing roses no matter where you plant it or how you water it. Scene seven, in alphabetical order, course by course and class by class, the names and photographs of the pupils at the school where Timmy is enrolled begin to appear in succession. The pictures of some of the boys and girls begin to be imprisoned within circles drawn by a red felt tip pen. Near the cages of red ink appear the following labels, physical aggressor, verbal aggressor, or silent accomplice. The list of pupils continues filing until their faces fade, some melting into others in a dark, macabre, and sinister children's dance. Scene eight, darker and noticeably larger. The house now has a rather sinister look. The horn continues to grow on Timmy's picture and his mouth has disappeared from his nose to his chin. It is an empty space. There's nothing. Irene, standing by the door, is holding a plate of food. Daniel is sitting in the armchair holding a file who neither looks at or speaks to or interacts with the other. They only, they only look forward like a pair of statues. There is the impression that time has stopped. trying to talk with him for half an hour. But it's impossible to pay me no attention. What are you doing for? I don't know if it would do much good. It's not bad if you turn off the lot. Probably worn out. Are you sleep? It's not been two days since he stopped talking. That's not the worst part. I think he's also not me. I called his teacher and the woman in charge of the cafeteria, but they say they see nothing strange that he's been doing. We have to press charges on you. The attorney says we'll likely win if we do. So I don't know what we're waiting for. The information about the investigation they've done doesn't add up. And they know it very well. It can't be that the level of bullying he's been exposed to is only 5%. And when Timmy started identifying the aggressors, he identified 253 students. How do you explain that?
School's obligation is to activate protocol. And the principal didn't do that. He washed his hands of the matter, used the backpack as an excuse, and put the blame on us. Are you going to spend the whole day like this? In silence, not opening your mouth? Worry. My head is starting to hurt. Well, we have to reach an agreement. Are we going to do it or not? I'll say it again. I find the boy different since he's returned to school. Yes, I know that. But the person who investigated said we don't have to worry. Right? Do you find things don't change every night? Yes. Yes, they do change because until they suspended him and he began to spend all day here with us, the boy seemed fine. I beg you, please. I tell you that things were bad for him at school with you and with me. It was much worse for him. Worse? They stripped off his clothes. They threw him on the floor and tried to assault him. What if you and I done anything like that? There are many ways of mistreating a person. And you think we mistreated our In son? a way, yes. How can you say that? In what way did we mistreat him? I don't know that the child doesn't eat or speak, and we don't know what's coming next. I am worried. I already told you I'm that. I am worried, too. We're both worried. That's why we have to talk and find a solution. Changing schools seem like a good solution to me. One they suggested is close by and we can walk. It's not a question of how close or how far it is. That is not the point. What's the point? Do we confuse them until we can't endure it and does something else stupid? What stupid thing can you do? I don't know, but all this hassle with accusations and psychologists is doing him harm. Then what do we do? Teddy says he prefers to stay where he is and he doesn't want to change schools. Besides, changing would be, would be like admitting that he's the one who has the problem, and the problem is not with him. Maybe, maybe the others have a problem, but it is not Timmy's. If anyone needs to leave that school, there's those 253 savages and the son of a bitch principal for allowing it. The only thing Timmy has done is defend himself. And if they hadn't ganged up on him, none of this would have happened to anyone. As simple as that. 253 are too many to look for a new school in the middle of the term. The school has suggested a way probably because it is the simplest and the most practical thing for him. Yes. But what happens if the most practical and simple thing turns out not to be the fairest? And I don't think it's fair that he should be the one less. Well, at least we'd be finished with this once and for all. Yes, but there are a lot of things that don't make sense. It's not just that. Or did the principal tell you, right, that all the students were calling him names and picking on him? Because it can't tell us that all the students were bullying him and then say that according to the investigation carried out, the harassment he was exposed to is only 5%. Did all of the students pick on him or only 5% of them? Which is it? Was the principal aware that they were attacking him or didn't he realize it at all? And if he didn't realize it, then how is it possible that he called us and met with us to tell us the opposite? Was he drunk? Did you imagine it all? Fuck, I mean, we aren't dummies. Why didn't he call someone to investigate that? Why didn't he follow the rules? Didn't he remember? Or did he forbid the backpack all on his own? I don't know, maybe I'm just speculating and the school administration can bend the rules if they like and I'm sitting here talking to be talking with no idea at all. No. The administration can't bend the rules as they please, but what they can do is meet with the families and come to an agreement before making a decision. Sure, but when did they do that with us? The 
Yeah, I went to the office to speak with them. Court of school should have followed the rules and started an investigation, but the principal instead of that suggested to me an alternative. And alternative. What alternatives? Not to follow the usual procedures resulted in a more discreet point. Did not attract attention. Not long ago, when you said to me, you said, no matter how much you prove and prove. Jasmine, the carnations are for me to bloom on a rose bush. So many roses are going to bloom on a rose bush. Well, that is something that my head has never been able to accept because what my head has been determined to believe day and night is just the opposite. Since he was small, I have always been afraid that the child might be different, that it wasn't. Like the rest, and that fear, instead of diminishing his big growing, to the point that on occasions, on occasions I've even felt ashamed of him. Every time I go to the school to pick him up and I see him come out the door, the same thing always comes to my mind. Why have I had to have a son like him? You have always thought positive things about Timmy. You have always said positive and nice things about him. But not me, Daniel. Because although it's hard for you to recognize, I have always been like all of those people who take pride in belonging to the great majority and who you so despise. They say a mother must love her son, whatever he's like, and above all else, right? What does it mean then that I don't love mine? I don't love my son, Daniel. I don't love my son. I don't love my son. Teaching this play every semester since Mary and Cross play. The play was published in 2018. And this scene especially sparks such intense discussion in the classroom. And it's it's amazing. I always ask for a show of hands how many people can't relate to this play, that they don't know what bullying is, that they've never played a role in it, either uh, the bully or for the bully. And there's not been a hand raised yet. Um, these are the kinds of plays we need to bring into the classroom um, to move the conversation forward in the intensifying intolerance that is being forced by um, ridiculous legislation that's being passed, like for instance, in my home state of Florida, um, and we're not going to move forward um, by banning critical theory, but by including plays like this one on our syllabus and on our stages. There's still no U.S. production of this play. When I teach it, I show my students images, production stills from around the world, everywhere else. Why not here? I'm going to read the epilogue of the play. This play was inspired by events that took place in North Carolina, 2014. Michael Morales, age 11, was brought to the emergency room 
after attempting to hang himself from the bunk in his room because he could no longer endure the insults and attacks of his schoolmates. During the suicide attempt, Michael was without oxygen for several minutes, suffered permanent brain damage, and is in a semi-vegetative state. The present tense is to be spared because at the publication time of the script, Moroni is still alive. He has since passed away. He was a fan of the animated series, My Little Pony. A month later, Grayson Bruce, nine years old, was forbidden entry into his school for carrying a My Little Pony backpack. The school principal considered it, quote, inviting bullying. If the minor came to the school with a backpack, even accusing the boy of having provoked, quote, disorder in the classroom. The famous animated series, My Little Pony, which paradoxically dedicates its episodes to, quote, the magic of friendship and the values of comradeship, has become, in an unexpected way, one of the major symbols in the fight against bullying. This play is dedicated to Michael Morones and Grace and Bruce, and all the boys and girls who, like them, have suffered insults and violence without anyone or by them doing anything to prevent it. I think we're done with the many books that we have collectively brought to the podium. There's a little library in here of Marion um, that was not at all scripted. Like there, there was no you know, thing on the invitation that we books, but we all did, and we would love that. Um, I want to thank everyone who contributed to this and ask if there are any comments, given what we just saw, or perhaps if the actors want to speak as people and not as uh, <laughs> as the angel and the cross. <laughs> Okay. Thank you all for coming. Hopefully, we can have an uh, informal conversation and as we mingle before we exit. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No, he did know he just, he just spoke.